Okay, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Lou. I trust that uh, the weather is nice in Maui, where I understand you were coordinating this evening. Yes, uh, it's, yes, it's thank beautiful. You. Thank you for asking. Thank you to everyone who is on Zoom or will join Zoom uh, later. Thanks to those who are in the room for the third session of this year's Great Decision Program that for the benefit of those who may be online or here for the first time, as well as for uh, our speaker, Norbert Holtkamp and his wife, Maria, the Great Decisions Program is a public education program organized by the Foreign Policy Association, which is a nonpartisan group based in New York that's been doing this for almost 60 years. Uh, and this is one of literally hundreds of such groups around the country that most of which use people out of the local community to talk about the chapters in the workbook that Great Decisions Program puts together. Because we are located so close to Stanford and because I've been fortunate enough to have a career that intersects with a lot of interesting people. Uh, we have brought in folks who know a lot more than average citizens do about the subjects. I am really delighted um, that this important subject, transnational, international science collaboration, and what that means for national security, but also to address an issue that is near the top of the agenda in Washington, as a concern has been for about five years. In my judgment, has been badly mishandled by particularly the Trump administration, but some of it has continued into the Biden administration. We need open science. We need international cooperation. We, the United States, if we are to be remain the preeminent scientific, economic, military player on the world stage, we need cooperation with other people. But we've gotten into an overreaction that sharing our education system, our laboratories with people is a risk, a security risk. And this is a subject that I've been on a National Academies panel for four years. By chance, initially, um, uh, discovered that Norbert, who had just moved to the Hoover Institution uh, from his former position as the deputy director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, to develop a program on exactly the problem that the National Academies uh, are working on. He knows international science. He will describe some of his own participation in big science on an international scheme. But for the last year or so, I guess, at, at Hoover has okay. been de designing, developing, and executing a program to bring together some of the security people associated with the Hoover Institution and scientists, science administrators, university research directors, so we can push back against some bad decisions, so we can design, uh, devise effective means to ensure that we maintain security and economic competitiveness, but not at the price of scientific accomplishment. I don't want to take any more of Norbert's time. Uh, I accept to say thank you for coming. I'm going to go into, into the audience and thank everybody else for joining us this evening. Very good. Answers to the audience questions. Okay. I'm ready to start. We can? I guess so. Okay. Let me share um, a presentation that... Um, that I prepared for tonight. It's based on something uh, very similar I did recently. Um, 
see how this works. You should be seeing the, um, let me just make sure that I can do the sharing correctly here. You can see it, right? Okay, yes, very we can, good. We can see your slide. Okay, excellent. So what's there is up there, they can see. Okay, wonderful. Very good. So thank you very much for inviting me tonight. This is very unexpected, and but very pleasant. And I hope we uh, can spend a couple interesting, you know, 10 minutes, maybe 40 minutes together. And I want to achieve two things. One thing um, Tom Marie talked about, right, the impact of uh, international collaborations on economy, on security, national security, on science advancement, um, and a number of other things I'm going to address, which is really in this stress position right now in research security, like Tom described. Um, and uh, I got into this, and I'll tell a little bit more about it in a, in a second here. Just uh, OK, let me advance the slide. OK, here you go. All right, so a little bit to my background. I'm an, my wife and I are immigrants ourselves. So um, we uh, were both born in Germany. Uh, I was born in 61. Um, I studied physics in Berlin and Darmstadt. Um, a PhD, graduated in physics and electrical engineering. Worked at a number of national laboratories, big science laboratories, which I'm going to talk about. I'll give you a couple of examples. You actually have one run in front of your door here, so we'll talk about that too. Um, and then moved around in the States. So we lived in Chicago first uh, at Femi National Accelerator Laboratory that at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, moved back to France to something called ITER, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then came to Stanford University in 2010. Um, I was an associate lab director first for accelerators, which is my core expertise, and then became deputy director and project director for uh, one of the big science projects, which I have a little movie for you. So it explains actually what we what we do, just in case you care or worry about what happens, you know, on Central Road. Um, then I took a sabbatical in Berlin. Um, my wife and I were there for like six months, and I get a phone call, an email from Condoleezza Rice, Secretary Rice. is like, Norbert, can we talk? And I, I have never met Secretary Rice. I didn't know her before. Of course, I knew about her, and we had a wonderful chat. And she knew that I was worried about. You know, did some research about think tanks, what they do, how they function in Europe or in the United States. And she said, you know, if you really want to do this, why don't you come figure it out? Um, so she invited me to join Hoover. That was April last year. And I'm, you know, right before my one year anniversary, I would say. Um, and it's been quite a ride. Uh, I'll tell you about that too. Um, since 2015, we are um, your citizens actually dual citizens and we're married, two sons, both live in the Bay Area and uh, we're grandparents since uh, December of 2022. Kind of very nice too. So that's kind of where we are. So what did I do in my life? Uh, and why why do I believe I can, we well, have some competence to talk about this. Um, the Department of Energy National Laboratory System is something that's very unique in the world. And the total investment from the government side, your taxes, is about $40 billion annually. And it's distributed over 17 laboratories that are scattered across the country. Um, in the Department of Energy, you know, there's a national uh, uh, security, uh, NNSA, that's the biggest piece. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit too, uh, what it did and where it came from. And Office of Science is another arm. That's where all the science, it's actually one of the largest science funders in the in the United States and, and worldwide in terms of basic and fundamental science. And it is everything from, you know, fundamental forces of matter, which is kind of on the left-hand side of this uh, um, slide, you know, Atlas, the detector at CERN, you know, the big um, basic science facility in, in, in Europe, in Switzerland, Geneva, to biology, to earth science, to really to the very big, you know, astronomy, Dark energy, dark matter, where does the world come from? You know, how it's going to develop, you know, da da da. It's a really interesting piece. And the laboratory that's right in front of our nose here is called SLAC. It used to be called the 
Stanford Linear Accelerator, but today it's called the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, and has a budget of about $550 million annually and employs about 2,000 people or so. So, so what is my real background? You know, what did I spend my fun time on, which is really relevant on this? Um, so this is a facility called DAISY. Um, and uh, at about six, six and a half, what you see actually, you know, is a horse race track on the right-hand side of this picture up here. Let me just, uh, oops, can I see my, uh, I can, I can use the, okay, whatever. I can see the, uh, use the, uh, the mouse. So let me go back. Um, but you see the racetrack, that's about a six and a half kilometer, three and a half miles circumference tunnel underground, basic research facility. That's how I got into big science, you know, in the eighties, cost about a billion German marks back then. So half a billion US dollars. Then in 98, my wife and I moved to, uh, um, to Chicago. There's another big facility called Fermilab, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. You see another big underground construction, about a billion dollars in investment from the government. Uh, and then the first one that I really got, you know, was in charge myself, was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And it was a collaboration of six national laboratories in the United States called the Spallage Neutron Source. Uh, $1.4 billion construction, um, the world's most advanced neutron scattering facility. I'm not going to go into detail. It's a big science facility, and it was built with very advanced technology. 20 years later, it's still the world-leading facility, 20 years later. Europeans have tried to build it, failed. Chinese have tried to build it, failed. Uh, I mean, not failed to build it, but failed to actually come anywhere close in terms of performance. Now, you can take a very US-centric view and say, oh, this is the US clearly leading science. But if you really look behind the scenes and you know how we put that together, you know, there's an enormous amount of technology from Europe, Japan, and China in there. Uh, I actually brought a whole bunch of Russian scientists from Russia to help us build this facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And you can just imagine how that works, right? You know, in the middle of Tennessee, and, you know, 20 Russians are coming. They all think there's going to be another, you know, I don't know, invasion or something. Um, really interesting, um, but really high performance. The the next one, you know, got even bigger. So this is called ITA. Anybody heard about ITA? Some people call it ITA, but it's called ITA. It's a it's a big fusion facility. It tries to uh, mimic, you know, um, what the sun does, you know, on Earth. And it's a big international project. You can see the distribution actually. European Union pays about 45% of an undisclosed number, which is somewhere around 40 billion. Um, and, uh, and Europe, that's like 27 countries, right? So, um, and then US, uh, Japan, Korea, China, Russia, and uh, India, all members, you know, they all have a 9% share, share. So you think international collaboration, international science, that's big international science. That's why I developed my diplomatic skills, or didn't, whatever. Um, so I did this for five years. It's in a national organization, the treaty organization, actually. But what it really shows, it's a big, it's a big reactor. It's a, it's like a nuclear reactor. You get closer, you know. It's a little small picture here, but it looks like a nuclear reactor, and it really is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to produce energy. Uh, we get back to that in a second. And then finally, here at Slack, um, you all know Slack, right? You have heard the name. You know what it is. You went. You know, over 280 probably more off that I did and just watched down the tunnel thingy, right? The long, the long big thing down there. It was built in 62. So I just had a 60th birthday. And uh, when I came here, uh, we developed um, uh, Slack, did already something very unique, very, very unique uh, with this facility, built a, um, what's called a free electron laser. It's essentially it's a laser, it's like a laser pen. It just instead of making visible light, makes X ray lights. And it's about 100 billion times as bright as anything else in the world. 100 billion times. So that's how many zeros, Tom? Okay, that's uh, 11 zeros. Um, so I always say, you know, if you want to really compare this and comprehend this as a, as a normal being, 100 billion, just imagine, you know, you earn $1 today and tomorrow you're as rich as Elon Musk. That's about... Not quite 100 billion, but close. 
Interestingly enough, the intensity of the light we produce at these lasers is something that no electronic detector can really measure from one to 100 billion. Your eye can, the human eye can do this. Um, and the human eye can actually distinguish between that. It's about the difference between a really dark night in California, you know, with no moonshine, no nothing, and a bright sunny day, which we haven't had for a while yet. That's about the difference of 100 billion, 10 billion or so. Anyway, so did we built this, uh, we built a new facility. Uh, it it, uh, um, it up, upgraded the old accelerator, upgraded the old facility. And for the same amount of electrical energy, which is quite a bit, it makes about 10,000 times more light than the old one. So it's pretty cool, actually. Um, I'll show a little bit more about this just for the fun of it. Since Tom told me some of you are interested in science. Okay, fusion. Uh, this is what ETA is about. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you look carefully, there's this little person on the bottom. You see that? The little human being there? You know, it's almost undetectable, but it's there. So what we're trying to do at ETA, or try to do at ETA, and still people are trying to do, is uh, put the fire of the sun into this, uh, into this device and extract energy. Um, talked about the international organization, um, you've probably heard about fusion quite a bit. If you read a little bit of technical stuff, you know, there's a big fuss in, in Livermore right across the bay here, right? Um, uh, controlled fusion, not a bomb, but controlled fusion was done the first time. And uh, and if you really want to know whether this is going to be a nuclear power, a power plant at some point or not, I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow at Slack. At 3.30, you can zoom in, just a little advertisement, and we'll talk about... Uh, we'll talk about... Um, you know, is this science or is this actually going to be a power source, right, for the future, which is what many people promise and nobody has delivered so far. Okay, um, what else? Um, so this is a little bit of a movie. This is what, what actually happens uh, at Slack. Did anybody take, ever take a tour at Slack? You did, okay. Anybody else? Tom did, okay, good. All right, if you want to, you should. You know, you can sign up. And if you really want to get a VIP tour, you just talk to me. I'll, I'll get you one. Um, so um, and offer that to people here and people at the Zoom actually. So just get in touch, you know, via Tom or anybody. So what you really see is an old accelerator. This is a pipe where electrons, which are kind of marked by these blue little electrons, are not blue, right? So just to see them here as a as blue little balls, they go into this accelerator. They're accelerated, and uh, they brought up to the speed of light over about two miles. And at the end, when they come out, you know, we manipulate them and. Uh, they come out very short, they come out very intense. And then, you know, when they are finally accelerated to the very, very end, you'll see something we do to these electrons, which is really cool. Um, so we send them into permanent magnets, magnets that we, you know, tip on walls, right? The same thing you can use to pin things on walls, permanent magnets. They have a north and a south pole, and every two centimeters, the pole changes. And what it does to the to the charged particle, it wiggles the part. Here it happens. So you'll see that in a minute here in a detail. It wiggles the particle around. So it goes on a snake-like movie. So when it does this, like you'll see here in a sec, um, it starts to emit photons, light. And now the particle goes forwards and the photon goes forwards, both at the speed of light. So it sees its light that it's created itself. And it manipulates it. And you see very much something that's called microbunching. And it's a little bit like cicadas. When you ever sit in your garden, have a glass of wine, and you listen to cicadas, right? You have this ground noise. And then every so often they synchronize up, right? And it gets very loud and very noisy. Right? You've heard that, I'm sure, right? Same thing happens here with the free electron laser. All the electrons suddenly, you know, emit light, same wavelengths, same phase, you know, all in synchronization. And then you got a laser. So the intensity goes up, you know, about 100 billion times actually pretty pretty cool stuff so you think that's cool um you know i showed this to the national science national security fellows at hoover i gave them a tour and they're like wow this is pretty good um okay so um let's see um keep going here hopefully that stops at some point here all right and uh let me just going here all right that's what it looks like so this is a new you can't see anything it's all of these big pipes 
but it sits at about minus 272 degree C, minus 468 degree Fahrenheit or two Kelvin. So it's colder than the universe. And if you do that to material, you know, you can do very fancy stuff, but very efficient. DOE pumped about a billion dollars, $1.1 billion into this in here. And what we do with this thing is you take a laser and what you see, you see the laser light hitting a virus that comes from the top. So there's enough light in there that we can take a 3D picture of a virus in one shot. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, I've talked enough about science. Let's talk about politics. Okay, why Hoover Institution and why now? Um, first of all, I don't think I need to convince many people here that international collaboration in science and technology is very important. I think Tom already pointed it out. It's important to convince the people that don't believe in international collaboration and don't believe in science and technology you know, that this is very important and why it's important. And Hoover is a good place to do this. Hoover is considered to be, you know, suddenly a conservative, you know, think tank. Um, and uh, um, loves very smart people, no question. But Hoover really also did a lot of work um, um, on, um, you know, China, China relationship, and rightly so pointed out the risks. So we get to that. Hoover also has a um, is engaged in policy questions. You know, it does advise people on in Washington and everywhere else on policy. And there have been lots of meetings, Tom and I go. And especially during the Cold War, you know, um, there was a general consensus that science, you know, I wouldn't say did diplomacy, but certainly aided diplomacy at many levels, um, um, especially in nuclear science and nuclear non-proliferation non kinds of stuff. Um, there were a lot of scientists at Hoover actually at some point. Edward Teller was there, um, and Bert Richter was there, Pete Bonofsky was there, Sidrell, you know, all names in the science com community that are big names. Uh, they all died. They were dead by now. They all got old and, and, uh, and died away. And since then, it has been mostly focused on economy and, um, and, and history and, you know, the archives and so on. And when Secretary Rice took over as a president of the uh, present director of Hoover, you know, she knows uh, Stanford. She knows she was a provost at Stanford. And she, of course, understands the importance of science and technology. And she started something that if you want to look it up, it's actually the right hand corner here. Uh, it's called the Stanford Emerging Technology Review. And it has a very broad spectrum. It talks about synthetic biology, physics, AI, space, um, nanofab quantum computing, chip design, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and in this um, uh, in this whole review, there's a general strategy to bring scientists back into the conversation. I mean, high hardcore scientists, physicists, you know, biologists, chemists, engineers back into this conversation. And that's kind of how I come into. Now let's talk about, you know, what Tom, you know, did when he kicked it off here. I think there's a question in the chat here. Let me just... Is the chat? There's a question in the chat. Is there anything special in the chat that I should worry about? Uh, uh, no, uh, it's totally up to you whether you want to answer the questions now or whether you want to wait until the okay, end. Okay, I'll probably do it, do it at the end if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. So let's do that at the end. Okay, so risk management for international collaborations. I mean, it is true. There is a risk. I mean, there's one thing where the science community really fails to react in a timely manner. Um, Russia and China, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, have changed the rules of the game. China, you know, beginning 2000, 2010, around, has clearly declared um, that they uh, want to use any means to get ahead in terms of science and technology, you know, whether it's relevant for military applications or economic ones, and they do apply any any means to get to that, uh, legal, illegal, um, you know, people, talent programs, anything. So it is correct, there's a risk and the risk has to be managed. And we'll talk about, you know, the risk and the benefits and the management a little bit more. So, um, so what is really an international collaboration? And that's kind of an interesting thing when you read about it or hear about it, or, you know, when I talk about it, it all sounds great. And it sounds like there's an, you know, kind of an agreed upon rules of engagement, right? You know, if I collaborate with you, 
we freely change share information. You know, I do something, I give it to you. You do something, you give it to me. I, I give you technology, you give me technology. So it's a two-way street. Um, interestingly enough, and we'll get back to that later, is while this has been working since World War II, kind of, it's in people's mind. It's nowhere written down. The rules of international collaboration actually do not exist. Scientists live by them for a long time. So when somebody changed the rules, you know, it was kind of a, whoops. Um, and I always say there's two ways to win a game. You can either be the better player or you change the rules. Okay, China and Russia changed the rules. So we'll talk about that too. Anyway, so international collaboration is based on values and respect and mutual benefit and open exchange. What's interesting about this is it, you know, start this conversation at, Ho at Hoover, in Washington, wherever, it immediately breaks down in two elements. One is talent, and that has anything to do with attraction, immigration, recruiting. How many people do we need in science and technology here? Where do they come from? And you know these things as much as I do. Half of the unicorns in the Silicon Valley are run by foreign nationals. First, uh, you know, uh, uh, second generation. There's no question. The U.S. needs about 500,000 science and engineers educated every year to feed the universities, the tech sector, you know, advancements, chips production. And, you know, when you read this today, you know, if you read below the lines, read details, you can read here. It's not enough, right? Can't find the engineers. You know, they're not trained. You know, we don't have the right people, blah, blah, blah. So 500,000 people. About 20 years ago, it was about half that. 20 years ago, about 10% were foreign nationals. Today, it's about 25%. So what does that mean? One thing it means, if you make a mistake and you cut off, for whatever reason, political or others, you cut off this stream of immigrants, um, you will immediately affect, not immediately, but you will affect the economy. The problem is you don't do it immediately. It takes about 10 years for any kind of, I don't know, person like me, you know, postdoc, you know, get through the system and become a useful member of whatever, a company, a science enterprise, or whatever. So if somebody says today, I cut off 25% of the intelligence stream, you'll see it in about 10 years. The problem is, by the time you realize it, it takes 10 years to fix it. And I don't think this country or we can afford, you know, any country can afford to lose 20 years. It's just not in the books. We will lose the race. So if we want to win the race, we'll have to do something different. We have to be careful about this. But the, the, the um, security community, or parts of it at least, you know, talk about this in interesting terms, which I just learned about the meeting we're in, right? You know, this is a risk. Let's just do, you know, go to a small yard with a high fence. What does that mean? You know, okay, cut off immigration. You don't let anybody in who potentially is a risk. And I always said, you know, it's like when somebody breaks into your house, which probably happened to a couple of us, I mean, did you build a high concrete wall around your house nobody can get through anymore? No, you didn't, right? Probably installed a security system. You know, you still want the Amazon packages to be delivered. You know, want your friends to come in. So you manage the risk. That's what we have to do. Um, the other thing, which is uh, actually, but there's kind of actually a lot of um, consensus and an easier consensus on managing immigration and managing talent come to the United States. It's not so difficult, the conversation. You can convince people that this is important. There's many reasons why that is the case. What's much more important is uh, difficult is engagement. So should we, the scientists, be allowed to continue to engage with Chinese or Russian scientists? You know, do we understand the risks? You know, do we actually understand who we work with when we collaborate over there? And I think many of the points made by Freeman Spogli and the Institute by the experts at Hoover, at any of these other think tanks, and even by politicians, rightly so, is in many ways we didn't. Collaboration was considered to be an open, free enterprise where risk was not really an issue. Risk became an issue when there was industrial espionage, but not in the science community. And that clearly has changed. So we have to manage these things. But it's a lot harder to convince people that this is important to advance science. And I'll give you a couple of examples where, where you'll see what kind of an impact it has 
to international. I showed you my stuff, right? I mean, there's lots of other stuff, but this things that are really close to your heart and close to your, you know, pocket to money that really make sure that the and the thing is, well, you convince them talent is okay, you know, but engagement we don't need. And the question part of my research is actually, is that true? Can you really independently have a talent stream come into the United States without international engagement and without international collaboration? And, you know, my first reaction would be no. But when I told people, you know, my reaction is no. The answer from Hoover was, well, hard camp, that's great. You know, you have an opinion like that, prove it. So we try to prove it. Um, and this is where some of the engagement and some of the activities come from. Okay, so here's the hypothesis. Um, international science collaboration, you know, is required to win the race for the U.S. scientific and technical leadership, if not dominance. Right? And I gave you a couple of examples on my own experience here, interesting stuff. It's important and crucial for the economy. Talked about that a little bit. That's probably easier. You know, science and technology translation was certainly and 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 is today a dominant factor in wealth generation. I'm sure you all have, you know, big stock stock things, you know, anywhere here from the tech sector, right? And you saw what happened the last six months, right? Nine months. It's like, sure, is technology important? Obviously. Um, placement. That's an interesting one. So um, and and the example that was given in the seminar that we did. You know, it was actually uh, the reunification of Germany and East Germany. You know, East German scientists knew that they were behind. That wasn't the problem. They clearly knew. They didn't have the money, they didn't have the infrastructure, they knew. But what they didn't know is how far they were behind. All right. So one thing is that clearly comes of international collaboration. We know what they do. They might know what we do. But we clearly know where we are. And if we don't engage internationally anymore, then we don't. I was in a CIA briefing, actually, you know, where the, uh, the, the CTO of, of CIA was here. And, and uh, you know, and I gave him the spiel, right, the whole thing about international collaboration. And 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 he's like, oh, yeah, I thought you're, you're, you're a fusion scientist. You know about fusion, right? And I'm like, yeah. Um, and I said, so can you tell me what's happening in China with fusion? And I'm like, look. Didn't I just explain to you, you know, what happened in the United States in terms of not collaborating anymore and not being allowed to travel anymore and not, you know, not doing this? So how would I know? And, oh, yeah, he says, yeah, he understands. And I said, luckily, I can go to European conferences and I can meet Chinese colleagues and I can ask him. So I can tell him a little bit. And I did. But uh, um, it's it's a second order knowledge. And we have lost a lot about this, actually, in, in, in many, in many, many ways. Um so science diplomacy, we talked about that. It is, although it's very, very much questions by, by you know, um, politicians and strategists. You know, when I had a conversation with somebody who's an expert in, you know, diplomacy and exchange, and I made this point about science as, as a tool for diplomacy, he's like, ah, oh, well, we don't need that, you know. Diplomacy comes first, science comes second. And... Uh, and uh, um, so it's not really an aid. And Tom can talk about this much more elaborate than I can do, but he, he lived through this period where the exchange among scientists was still possible and happened, and the doors stayed open while the doors between politicians were closed. Um, so there is an exchange of, of information and and uh, and just, you know, knowledge, right? And, and uh, that made it easier. s and talent attraction, getting the best and the brightest. That's been the U.S. business model, and uh, and risk and benefit to talk about that. So, who has seen the movie Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. No. Yes. Yeah. Good. All right. Good. So well, yeah. So almost everybody, right? We'll get back to the movie Oppenheimer because it's actually. I hope you see it for a second time. At the end of my talk, you will look at it very differently. Um, because Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project is what changed the U.S. research enterprise in many, many ways. Um, many of the national laboratories, all of them actually, that I talked about were founded after World War II and as a result of the Manhattan Project. All was structured like the Manhattan Project in many ways. All was structured in a way that Oppenheimer thought 
you know, just how his brain worked. When you look at the movie again, look at when Oppenheimer leaves the room after the movie, he always asks, is there anybody or anybody else who, who has a, you know, who has another idea or has a better idea? He doesn't care who's there, whether it's a technician, an engineer, you know, a foreign scientist or anybody else. He asks everybody. This is very different than the good old German, you know, where the Herr professor knows everything and, you know, he says something and it's over, right? No more discussion. This changes the way people work. And it did. And I made a big piece of there. The other thing is, um, you know, you probably didn't realize that, well, if you know the story, then you do. But, you know, there's two big characters in this movie, right? There's Oppenheimer and there's General Groves. So General Groves built the Pentagon before he did became in charge of the of the uh, uh, Manhattan Project, building the bomb. And he was clearly from the security side, obviously, right? So, and his idea was, you know, compartmentalize information, right? Don't share. So if something gets lost, you only lose a piece. That's that's how national, that's how security works. That's still today, compartmentalize. Oppenheimer was, well, if you want to build me a, you know, a nuclear bomb that nobody has done before, um, in, in a couple of months, you know, in 20, 23 months at the end, there's no way that we can advance science fast enough. I will have to select the people. I will have to have an open conversation. I will have to be able to talk to them and share every piece of information if this is supposed to go fast. Well, it sure get, did get done fast. I mean, there's not a question, right? It's the, the uh, kind of fundamental example still of, of the fast, you know, science project, ultimate ultimate uh, speed. There's a book that Groves wrote in, I think it was 48, way out of, even in the 50s afterwards. And he actually said uh, that Oppenheimer was right. And without the foreign talent involvement, and that included people from Hungary, you know, from Russia, you know, from all over the world. Uh, many of them, most of them actually were fleeing Nazi Germany. Um, but, you know, some of them were accused of being communists. Some of them were accused of, I don't know what, whatever. He just brought them together for this one purpose. And the way they managed the risk is they went to a Mesa in Los Alamos, you know, in New Mexico, you know, I don't know, 600 feet high walls on all sides and one bridge across. So all the scientists up on the Mesa and then you, 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 you know, you control the bridge. Um, bridge is still there, actually. So if you go to Los Alamos, you can still see it. Well, what happened? Did they keep the secret? No. Secret went out, right? Ultimately, the Russians got it. So so the high fence and the small yard versus, you know, controlling the leak and running faster has been also a business model. It's been very successful, much more successful than closing down and, and, and not leaking. Um, okay, so then we organized... Uh, um, and this is what Tom was talking about. That's that's what he's on. Has been working on with this team for four years almost now. Uh, the National Science Technology Security Roundtable. Uh, we had a meeting. Uh, we actually brought the whole team here um, to uh, Hoover uh, in conjunction with Stanford. And that was an interesting conversation. Just you know, why should we do this at Hoover? You know, why the National Academy? You know, and the think tank like that, and shouldn't that really be a university thing? I was I'm actually we're glad to do it at Hoover at the end, right? So, like I said, right? Ultimately, the goal is to convince the people that don't believe this is important, uh, not the people that all believe it. All right. Um, so this just happened actually recently, and then I thought the the best the best person to talk about this, you know, really today, um, is. Uh, it's not advancing. Mm. Come on. Come on, go to the next slide. I probably have to unshare and share again. Yeah, it's stuck. I'm sorry. It doesn't advance. Let me share it again.
30 seconds. Oh, yeah, let's take that mouse, that pointer off the screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, now here we go. I apologize for the little delay. Now here we go. That way, Zoom can do. Screen share is loading. Mm, okay. Ah, here we go. All right. Okay, so we had a um, so the idea was to bring somebody in who really has to live with the um, security side as well as the science side. So Los Alamos National Laboratory, my, many of you probably know, still is today a weapons laboratory. They produce you know much of the nuclear weapons, all of the nuclear weapons actually. Um, um, yeah, doesn't. I'm I'm sharing here, so I don't know why it's not going up. I, I you know we'll we'll see. Uh, it's better than nothing. So um, the uh, um, and and um, it's, so it's a laboratory with a six million dollar budget. It has about twelve thousand people. Many of them are foreign scientists, actually. Um, and the question to Tom Mason, who's a lab director, is all the time actually, why do you bring all these foreigners to to Los Alamos National Laboratory when you know you know you have the you know the U.S.'s biggest secret on the other side of the fence? And, and so he came and gave a talk about that. You know, why is that important? Why is science important for the overall enterprise? So here you go. Um, and Tom made a, a very elaborate point about, you know, how open science, you know, attracts people into doing really interesting stuff and it needs infrastructure to do so. And, you know, it allows the laboratory to pick the best and the brightest because they continuously rotate people in and out um, and then they, you know, many stay, many become U.S. citizens, many start working really on not only open science, but also national security issues and, 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 and go with it. So he made a really important point about it. And we spent a whole day about, uh, on, this, on this conversation. Also because, you know, including Secretary Rice, people came, Hoyt can prove your case. Um, give me some case studies, right? So what is a good case study? How do you prove this? So we picked a few, very interesting. Uh, nuclear physics was one, well, you're not so interested in that one. There's one about, um, 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 you know, earthquake sites. So why why would Russia, China, and the US work on earthquakes? Oh, well, you know, if you wanna know what happens in North Korea when some, you know, freaky somebody, you know, starts a nuclear explosion, then, you know, you want to have the best detection systems around the world to actually measure that. So this actually did database, a nationally shared database that, that uh, where people work on this kind of stuff. Mars Rover was another interesting one. It's a national collaboration with the uh, with Russian and and uh, um, and European scientists where they build a laser a laser system that you know when the Mars Rover picks up rocks on Mars, the laser shoots at them, and you know you can do spectroscopy. This actually was used today in uh, in in weapons production. Uh, one of these things, you know, can people use to measure the effectiveness of a, of a, people call a pit, uh, is exactly that. But the most interesting one, and that gets to your purse. So this is, I think, where Americans are mostly interested, money. So um, EUV, extreme ultraviolet. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Heard the name? If not, have you heard the name ASML or TSMC? TSMC is a $15 billion company in Taiwan, builds all the advanced chips. Okay. ASML is a company in in uh, in uh, Netherlands, $25 billion, you know, dollar, you know, uh, um, growth income, 50% revenue. That's a company you want. Um, and they build the advanced tools to make these chips. These ships are based on lasers, on optics, on a very tricky way to make very short wave light, and on a very fancy system, ultra-stable 
to actually then make the wafers, you know, where you make these ships from. This technology was developed, you know, actually originally here in the Bay Area with people like IBM, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a lot of Japanese companies, da da da, and uh, and uh, it it laid the foundation to what we see here today, the AI boom, Nvidia, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, we can give a whole talk about the international collaboration that ultimately included Japanese, Koreans, US, Europeans, Chinese people, although not so much, because they've never been able, instead of a $200 billion investment from Xi Jinping, have not been able to replicate it as of today. Right. So the international collaboration clearly advanced that piece of technology faster than anything else. And without international collaboration, we're nowhere close. We'll still be talking about, you know, 50 nanometer chips and stuff like that. So very good case, actually very interesting case. Um, and probably the most interesting one. So, um, well, okay, I said probably close, come close to the end. That's fine. You know, it's not going fast enough. That's all right. So another little, little uh, plot here, you know, you read a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, and how China is going to take over and all that kind of stuff. When you look at the data, you can actually see that that the U.S. is just is just you know cutting it. I mean, it's just um, this is a picture from a study Marco Polo Institute artificial intelligence ecosystem. You follow students to grad students to postdocs. Blue is the United States, red is China, orange is India, yellow is Europe. And you see what comes out of the back end in terms of US AI experts, the stuff that drives the stock market today out here. You see that the majority of these people come out of China and they want to stay here. And it doesn't think, you know, take much to actually understand why. Who wants to work for somebody like Xi Jinping? Who wants to have a political officer sitting next to him, you know, all day long? Who does not want to be among the most advanced scientists in the world. And the US still is the place where that can mostly happen. A Japanese scientist actually pointed out to me, he said, I can come to the United States and work as a scientist among you. And after three years, I feel like a US citizen. He said, you can come to Japan, work with me as a US scientist or German scientist, whatever. And he says, after 10 years, you won't feel like a Japanese, right? So. That is the business model, and it's very successful. So don't screw it up. Um, you know, actually, it was laid out by by Oppenheimer. I made that point, and it it you know you go through history, right? So you know, nineteen fifty three, the uh, weapons, per, the uh, items for peace conference had a wave of immigration coming here after the agreement to work together on science. You know, the opening of China, you know, in 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 seventy eight from Carter, right wave of immigrants and Chinese coming here that, that fueled the economic boom. And you can get through all that data. You know, it's not so difficult to find out. Um, I have to do it more carefully because I'm told I have to prove it. And then most recently, actually, you know, Russian scientists, right? The opening of Russia. I think the US has sucked up basically every good scientist out of Russia that you can possibly find. Now, you can make policy decisions that are really wrong. The CERN Council, where Russia is not a member, it's an associated state, and as a lot of scientists at CERN in Geneva decided as a result of the Ukrainian war to kick out Russia, which in response to what Putin did, I think we all agree, is probably the right thing to do. But what happened is that 400 highly trained Russian scientists, you know, electronics experts, computing experts, have to go back to Russia. Well, what do you think they're going to work on? Right? Certainly not high energy physics. So, so policy can go really wrong if you don't think about the second or the third step behind it. And that's, I think, is what we're trying to uh, trying to prevent. Okay. Um, yeah. So how do you want to do that? And I'm going to close with that slide. So what's the plan? Um, the plan is, you know, instead of building a fence and, and just, you know, kind of closing the leak is, you know, the US and Europe is surprised by the changing of the rules, right? China just declared we're going to do it differently. We're going to take every advantage we can get. And they open about it, whether it's talent recruitment or anything else. So we put controls in place. 
All right. So check marks. You know, you have to. Every scientist has to disclose this, that, and the other. I don't know. Your peer, your principal investigator. You want to collaborate somewhere. There's like fifty pages you have to sign. Who's going to read it? And what does it really help? And what does it do? Yeah. Okay. You can. You know, you can litigate afterwards if you find out somebody did something wrong. But it's not. That's a defensive game. That's not a way to win the game. We need to go back into offense. And and uh, and these are the four points that are necessary to do that. And that's what I'm going to work on for the, you know, for another couple of years, probably at Hoover right now. A healthy R&D ecosystem. We have to have the best infrastructure and the best people. There's no question. Interesting science stuff like Slack, you know, the laser I just talked about, will bring in the best people because the best people want to work with the best infrastructure, obviously. So continue to invest. That's not new. Attracting and retailing talent. Well, okay, many people talk. It's not new either. But here's the idea, you know, like a non-nuclear, non, a nuclear non-proliferation. And my talk about there is actually a consensus about what international collaboration is supposed to be like, but it's nowhere written down. Write it down, and then find the people in the world, the countries in the world that are willing to agree with you, and sign in. And when you sign in, you can collaborate. And if you cheat, you know, you get thrown out. And when you get thrown out, you lose access. You lose access to infrastructure, you lose access to, infra to IP, you lose access to, you know, what everybody else will advance faster than you. And you have to be honest about that. So we'll see. I'm so excited I can say, you know, yes, I sign up, I'm in. They cheat, they get out. So no. then you actually can put these controls in place. Right now, the defensive game needs us to put controls everywhere. You know, even if the US wants to, you know, collaborate with Germany right now, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people have to sign and it takes forever to actually get it approved and stuff like that. That only slows us down versus it's going to give the other ones a chance to go ahead. Anyway, that's an idea. Came out of this workshop, it was great. And with that, I'm going to close and I hope I had some interesting ideas put back in your head. A little bit about international collaboration and the kind of fun stuff that physicists can do. <clears throat> so the uh, the first question uh, uh, came about, I think, when uh, you were talking about uh, X-ray lasers. The question is, can they be used for energy generation and for weapons? Yeah, um, I mean, this is the old Ronald Reagan dream, right? You know, the uh, um, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, as it was called. Um, these kind of lasers, you know, produce very intense light, but the pulses are very short, and there's not enough energy in a pulse to actually destroy anything else but a virus. So, you know, you, you cannot really shoot down rockets or anything with this. There's people that develop lasers, uh, based on other technologies to do that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the application actually here, especially at Slack, is is nowhere going to weapons direction. In fact, Slack and Stanford, you know, do not work on on uh, um, on weapons-related or defense-related research. It's part of their fundamental statement. Um, now, can you do science that's relevant for weapons with an X-ray laser like this? Yes, you can. Um, and uh, there's certainly debate on my end whether whether we should um, in the world we live in, right? So, but it's not a this is not a laser that can shoot on anything. Questions in here. You showed a graph of where the where the blue was U.S with the um, grad students and post-grad. What I wonder is- um, This one? Yeah, that one. So I see grad, and the next one is that post-grad? Post yeah, post -doc. so it's undergrad. Post so yeah, it yeah. goes from left to right. It's undergrad. So the question is, I showed a graph, you know, this is the graph so that the shows point... essentially how talent moves. And this is particularly to AI, artificial intelligence. Right, so right? my it's question is, what, what about um, then, do those blue on the post docs, mm -hmm. do they stay here? Most of them. Because I'd like to see the next. Well, me too. Uh, 
But as you can tell, the studies from 2020 and Marco Polo is actually oh. committed to do that. I think it's supposed to come out uh, in the next couple of are months. Are we allowing them to stay, or do or do we? These are these are non-citizens. A lot of them. Well, uh, many of them. So these are mostly non-citizen. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the one from the U.S. You know that that you know goes to the system are mostly U.S. citizen. Um, but you know the one from China and from India and from Europe, of course, non-U.S. citizen. And typically, they 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 end up to be you know staying at least for many many years, which so, means they so will have to have a. They're not on unlimited visas or anything. Um, well, the, the visa is really only a problem to get in. You know, H one B visas, which are limited. You're correct. Uh, are essentially an entry, you know, thing. And after you can extend an H one B once for three years, so three years and three years, and then you either go. Or you um you have to uh, apply for a green card, and typically you know with a science background you always get one. Uh, the question, Lou, did that come? Did the question come through clearly on Zoom? Um, I do not see any other questions on. No, Zoom. did did the question that uh, Jean asked come through on from the microphone into the Zoom? Uh, yes, it did. She wanted additional clarification on the graph, which was provided. Yes. And I don't have the right yet. Nobody has. That's the problem. But we're all waiting for it. I can guarantee you that. <clears throat> yeah, the working anecdotal extension, not the kind of study that uh, Norbert correctly says is being done, needs to be done, is that from China, which has gotten the most scrutiny, 85 to 90 percent of those who come, make it to the PhD level, do not return to China. The larger pattern is among the reasons that there are such a large percentage of foreigners in advanced science engineering fields in the United States is because it can lead to a green card. That for a native US citizen, in most cases, it leads to a job where they earn less than if they went to work. Yeah, with so a that, master's that, level. that's a whole, that's a whole another conversation, another talk, yeah. right? You know, why do US kids, why are they not good at STEM? Why they're not interested in STEM? Why they don't move into STEM fields? That's a much more complicated conversation. Um, it's unfortunate. Some people say, you know, we didn't need foreign talent if we would have enough, you know, boys from, I don't know, the rest of the country and girls get into STEM. Um, fact of the matter is not even that it's true. You look at the numbers, you know, I said 500,000 per year growing. You know, you, you can't feed it. You need, yes, we need this country. We should do more to get you know, young kids through college because it's it's ultimately expensive. And many of them come out, you know, with a huge death on the other side, which is actually not acceptable. I mean, because nothing to study in Germany, zip, zero, right? Stanford just raised the, raised the uh, tuition again. I mean, seriously, talking about $75,000 or something annually, right? So, I mean, there is, there is an issue of money, but money is not the only reason. Um, I always make the joke about my son. My son is a bio the younger one is a biologist. He works in a startup here. I think when he started, he made something like 100K or something. He's now, you know, uh, related, soon to be married, sometime soon to be married uh, to a woman who's, supposed to, who's going to be a lawyer. And she just got an offer, you know, from a law firm in San Francisco, start salary 250000 So if you ask the question, why do we ask it's not to STEM? I mean, that's certainly one reason. <clears throat> Um, so I, I think the, well, anyway, I would say the crux of the concern is that some of the elite scientists who come here will then go back to Russia or China and whatever. Um, and they're motivated by something different than the 85% who mm -hmm. want to stay here and do top science. Um, I assume, you tell me if I'm wrong, that there's some level of interest in the psychologists, wherever they are, to be able to evaluate which ones are going to go back 
to the home country and mm -hmm. which ones are going to stay here. Does that go on? I mean, where they say, oh, sure. this, you know. Does it go on? It goes on big time. I mean, there's no question. The Thousand Talent Program, which is an official program that was launched in China in the beginning of 2000s or so, is targeting, targeting exactly those people. So the question was, you know, um, the concern is really about top level scientists, you know, when they go back, you know, are they being targeted to go back? Are they, you know, do they go back? And 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 what really happens uh, with that? Um, so some do go back. Uh, there's no question. Overall, the Thousand Talent Program was a failure. Um, it's called the Thousand. It's called the Thousand Talent Program. So if you do a Google search on the Thousand Talent Program, you will actually find a lot of information about it. It's an official political program in China that tries to you know attract scientists back to China. And you know there's big offers. You know big money, you know, they get a house, you know, they get research grants, you know, they get students, you know, but then they also get a political officer next to their side. Um, go ahead. I think my question really was from the other side, from the American side, do we do the same thing? Well, when we, when we see which of these scientists are here and ask them to leave because we don't trust that they're going to be. Yeah. So if you look at my last slide, you know, what I showed, that's actually my question. Where is the U.S. Thousand Talent Program? So far, you know, Oppenheimer, in many ways, got lucky, right? So all the European scientists came here, you know, for a sad reason, but they did come here. Afterwards, the U.S. had it all. Biggest economy, biggest science enterprise, most advanced science facilities. Obviously, all the people wanted to come, right? No question. That changed in the 80s and 90s when other countries modeled the U.S. business model. They built big science facilities. You know, they attracted people. They funded science. They were open. China was open for a long time. China was an open science community for a very long time. I used to go there until 2018 regularly, and you could have open conversations, and, you know, scientists would talk about it. They wouldn't talk about politics, but science was not a question. Today, impossible. Right? So um, another thing with Oppenheimer, you, you watch the movie again? What's the first thing Oppenheimer did? Don't remember? Nobody? He went to Europe to learn about quantum physics. He stayed there, he went there, he stayed there, he studied. He studied with the people in Europe. He made friends, you know, Pauli, all the people that came back later into the United States that either worked with him or certainly supported, you know, the, the, the exercise. Right? So how many students Take China again. How many Chinese students do we have in the Bay Area and the United States here? 300,000. How many students, U.S. students do we have in China? A couple hundred. At best, right? So, right. So, yeah. So, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, the part of the offense play has to be an aggressive, a more aggressive talent attraction program. But that means U.S. scientists have to go out, be allowed to go out, and U.S. people have to stop belief, you know, many U.S. people have to stop belief that U.S. is the only country, you know, where actually science is done and, you know, all the advanced technologies come from. They're not. So, which is fine. As long as the sum, you know, of all games stays here, there's not a problem with that. Nobody would have cared about the CHIPS Act and TSMC if there wouldn't be a threat. Nobody would care whether, you know, we continue to get good chips and cheap chips in Taiwan, right? Nobody would talk about Taiwan if there wouldn't be a threat. Actually, somebody pointed it out to me here from the Bay Area. It's great to have a $50 billion company that makes ships. But if you look at the economic, economic impact of what people can do with these chips and how much money they make, how, what an impact that makes, it's by orders of magnitude higher than chip production. Right. So chip production is only security, it's not money. Um, but yes, I agree with you. We need a thousand talent program from the US, no question. Okay. One more question. Um, we, have, we now have several questions uh, from the Zoom community. Um, the first one is two part. Can you discuss the Export Control Act as it applies to sharing scientific info in overseas conference? 
for example, employers of federal agencies. Okay, can you, sorry, can you read this again? Can you show yes. the export control? Yes, can you discuss the Export Control Act as it applies yeah. to sharing scientific information mm -hmm. in overseas conferences? Yeah, so, um, so this is kind of, I said at the beginning, right? You know, the aggressive act and the change of the rules by China and Russia um, was legal, illegal, and anything in between. So, you know, if something is classified or something is under export control, it's actually very clear. It's very clear rules. You break those rules, you know, you go to jail or, you know, the, the, the law is going to come after you. Um, these export control rules are, you know, often cumbersome, but, you know, whatever they are, they, they are being applied. And if you break them, if anybody breaks them, then there's a consequence. All right. So export control is actually one of these clean sites where it's very clean. You're either under export control or you're not. Um, export control has been effective to some sense, but it's also negotiable. Um, so um, I give you an example from somebody, Chris Ford, who, had, who you know, was in charge of export control for quite some time. I talked to him about, and actually he said that chip, you know, there was an idea to put all chip production, all chips under export control, all, all the technology. And he, and he, he said the uh, the minute they discussed it, the uh, chip companies actually, you know, IBM, you know, whoever came to him and said AMD, and they all came to him and said, no, this is not a good idea. He says, you know, these advanced, the advanced chips, yes. But, you know, all the other chips is, you know, we, we need them and we make money with them. So you put this in export control, you deprive us of the resource to develop our next generation. So there was literally an interesting one in conversation and negotiation between the chip manufacturers and the users and, and export control, you know, the Department of Commerce, on where they should put the line, 25 nanometer, 32 nanometer, um, and, uh, and do that. Now, an export control said, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, but, you know, universities today, you know, all large organizations, all of export, export control experts that make sure that, you know, people comply by these rules. Uh, and if companies or people do not, then they'll set as a consequence. Not sure that answered the question, but export control is not my 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 expertise. So a follow-up question there, are there vulnerabilities of scientists from uh, foreign countries here in the United States who still have families in the old country? Are there vulnerabilities of you know, sure. a country coming to a scientist and saying, you know, if you don't do X, Y, Z, your family back home is going to have something happen to it. Absolutely. That's part of the, you know, the 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 trick box that, that China and Russia is using and other people are using too, but China in particular. I mean, you have read this all in the news, right? You know, the illegal police stations, you know, um, Chinese students that are being targeted and have to report back to the embassies and to the consulates you know in the cities these are all true stories i mean this is correct people this is part of the aggressiveness you know and changing the rules of fundamental science um i mean espionage always existed right that you know we don't have to kill ourselves uh that that was you know industrial and non-industrial that always existed but targeting a science community on that scale that's changing the rules that's changing the game Yes, this all happens, you know, with all nastiness. And there's lots of experts at Hoover and Spooby that can talk about that, including a bunch of FBI and CIA people that have good stories about it. So, so the, the next question uh, from online is the following. Um, the government has spooked us about using Chinese products. Would you comment on that, please? Uh, the obvious one is TikTok, right? I mean, we've it's been in oh. the news, and you know. So, uh, what's your comment on on uh, the government spooking us about using products, uh, Chinese products that you know may have uh, security security leaks associated? Okay. So, so spooking is probably the right word. Um, the um, first of all, you know, we all have Chinese products. I don't know anybody not have an iPhone. Um, <laughs> I mean, come on, uh, let's not kid ourselves. Right? Economically, you can't decouple these two, two countries, these two economies. It's impossible. 
Now, security risks, yes, absolutely. Um, if you work in the national security sector, for example, we would have this conversation here not on Zoom, guarantee. Not, not allowed, not possible. You would use another platform. If you listen to the news this morning and at least in the national news, you would have heard a good story in Germany, you know, where a couple of generals had a conversation on WebEx where they talked about delivering Taurus, you know, um, whose missile types to Ukraine eventually and doing targets and the Russians listening in, believe it or not. Um, so, um, so I would say if, if you are in the private sector and we've talked to private sector people too, um, you know, yes, you have to be careful and, you know, you should know where, where the vulnerabilities are and do Chinese products like Huawei, you know, communication systems that the U.S. has banned or, you know, Zoom to some extent or many or TikTok have elements of manipulation and, and, and the back doors to get in. Yeah. I mean, I actually, I know about a research project in Switzerland where, you know, the people at a, at, at an X-ray laser, actually at a light source took a Chinese chip and, and dissected it nanometer by nanometer level. So really, you know, backwards engineered it. And sure enough, they found a backdoor. <clears throat> I, are we surprised? Should we be surprised? Well, I'm sure the U.S. chips with backdoors too, but uh, you know, no, we should not be surprised, but we should be aware and, and be careful. That's the same message actually in collaboration. You know, many things happen not because of bad will. It's it's naivety. So people have done collaborations with Chinese, you know, institutions without understanding that they're funded by the by the. Uh, um, uh, a People's Liberation Army, you know, PLA. So, so, you know, should we do that? Well, you know, if you talk about astrophysics, it's probably okay. If you talk about, you know, hypersonic, you know, technologies, it's probably not okay. So, the good old days are over, right? It, it used to be very clear. It's either, it's either classified or it's not. And if it's not classified, it's open. Today, this is much more complicated. The technologies I mentioned here, the technologies that we see today, in many ways, can all be weaponized much more easy than they used to. Let's take one in the room. Um, so there's another comment here. We've heard recently. We're going to take one in the room. OK. Um, what level of support or um, non-support in our federal government and the parties um is there now i mean is there is there across the board i'm not sure there's not support for the continued collaborations or yeah. is there a move to shut it down so tom can actually talk about this you know probably much more qualified i'm just a physicist you know what the heck do i know um you know i'm not a politician right the uh, um but what you can see that there's you know general consensus and an anti and sediment against you know um, collaboration and you know in many ways also immigration especially China Russia for sure um, this is and this is across the aisle so I think that's a that's a comment that's one of the things that Tom talked at the very beginning right he says it's an overreaction um, I think it's getting more moderated I think it's a science more science oriented committees you know in Washington Senate or House understand this, you know, in a much more detailed level. But it's a good way to kind of, you know, do bashing and, and make make a lot of noise. Um, I don't know exactly where that's going, you know, and and uh, I would say there's, there's certainly no general support for international collaboration, but I think there's also as a result of the panel that Tom is on, um, I think John Kenner said that, right, he's one of the co-chairs of the panel, you know, there's a move from being scared three years ago to, you know, the universities are not our problem and, and you know, hey, we need to get back into the future. We also need to plan for the future, right? Um, like somebody pretty high up told me once, hopefully, uh, I didn't say, I won't say the name she said, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a time after Xi Jinping and after after Putin, hopefully a better one, right? So we also need to plan. It's easy to shut things down. We have all seen this, COVID, right? But restarting is really easy. So we need to prepare for the restart. 
let's assume tomorrow Putin is gone. You know, how do we recouple? How do we reach out to Russia and you know get them back into the international system or China, whatever? So today I would say no, but anyway, it's your comment. Well, it's it's, it's Norbert's program, so I'll be be very brief in responding uh, uh, to it. That the general picture that he presented from my perspective is accurate. That any liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, if you're in Washington, China bashing, China's evil, that's part of the uh, atmosphere that's there. Uh, and there is a compunction to do it. There's a marked difference now uh, in again, my interaction with committees responsible for science, the oversight committees, who have become much more protective of maintaining the openness and international collaboration of the U.S. system that has been so successful, and the bashing, put up a higher fence, stop them coming, increasingly is concentrated in committees that have the capacity to make a lot of noise, but they don't control anything. Uh, they don't control funding. They don't control uh, the preparing of regulations that are under the you know, other side of the side oversight of executive branch. The other thing uh, that I would add is it's, that makes it even more complicated, and the CHIPS Act is a, an illustration, is a set of folks in Washington who, without quite admitting it, have decided that the way for us to compete with China and others is to imitate them. And having an industrial policy which has been rejected by Congress after Congress, that uh, you, you can't pick winners and losers. That's not the responsibility of government. That's private sector, that's scientists uh, working uh, to make things applied. They apply the knowledge. That's not a government function. And we've moved in the CHIPS Act in what looks a lot like another special interest getting a big pot of funding from taxpayers in, in there, but it's justified in terms of the threat from China. The other is the, the, the international character of science that uh, Norbert mentioned, being able to interact with Chinese by going to European institutions. Another variant of that is people are coming from European, Asian, other African, institutions they're working here and they go back and they work with Chinese or Iranian um, or or Russian uh, colleagues. So the idea that you'd pick good foreigners and bad foreigners, uh, good countries and bad countries is delusory that the world doesn't work that way. Um, so we have to be a lot smarter about it than we have become in my in my judgment. Those are changes with time, right? We're friends with Russia? No, we're not. We're friends with China? No, we're not. Today we are friends with India? We'll see what happens in 20, 30 years. So I would watch that, right? So um, not so clear. And even at the end, it's a political decision. You know, if, if the policy is, you know, somebody decides, you know, we have a high fence and a small yard, okay, you know, good. If that's the political consensus in the United States, but then there better be a plan B on where we get the science talent from to keep our economy up and stay ahead. Is there another question in the room? You have one? Yeah. 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 Hi, uh, you're a physicist. That makes you an astronomer and you're at Stanford. So you probably know about the Rubin LSST sure. in Chile. Would you like to speak about that as a big, big science project? First, like January 25? Yeah, well, my scale is actually not so big, but okay, I can talk about it. So yes, um, so um, the question is about the Vera Rubin uh, telescope as an example of a big science project. Um, the Vera Rubin telescope uh, is actually an optical telescope. 
is the largest one in the world in optical science. Um, if you look at your iPhone, I don't know what you have, the latest one, iPhone 15, you know, the camera has something like, you know, 16 megapixels or something, or 18, I forgot, I don't know, whatever. The Vera Rubin telescope is a big camera that we actually built here at Slack. And it has uh, 3.8 gigapixels. So your little thing, I don't have my camera with me, but your little camera at the back that you see when you look at your iPhone, right, that thing, the, the telescope is a camera that's about the size of a human being. And it takes, so what's the goal? What's the role? It takes a picture. It goes to Chile, goes up on a mountaintop, 4,000 meters high. And, uh, pardon? Comes out here. Well, yeah, the data comes out here. I mean, the camera goes there, but the data comes out here. Um, so the camera goes up on a mountaintop, and it's a collaboration between the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. And, of course, you know, uh, and of course the Chilean uh, government. Um, why Chile? Well, first of all, it's in the southern hemisphere, so you want to see the southern sky, you have to go to the southern hemisphere. And second of all, it's really dark, it's really dry, and you have a really beautiful view on the stars. You can't see the sky for stars. But Vera Rubin will probe questions about dark energy and dark matter, which make up 96% of the stuff. That's another whole talk about science. You know, I, don't want to, I, get, I can get too deep into this, but but it's an international project, yes. And uh, it's open data sharing. So um, so it will basically, you know, photograph the southern sky, you know, a um, couple of times every 24 hours. The data rates are phenomenal. Just imagine, right, how quickly you can put your storage for with your iPhone photos. You now think about a camera that's the size of a human being taking a picture, you know, of the whole southern sky yeah. a couple of times. So so it's an enormous data stream. Uh, it, it, yes, you're right. It ends up here. It will be managed here from, from Slack and from here. You know, every scientist who signs up for the collaboration will have access. So it's an international collaboration. It has an inter interesting security aspect. So what do you see when you take a big camera and you look up in the sky? Yes, a lot of things you're not supposed to see. Um, so actually, um, well, in principle, the data, and that was a big fight, was supposed to be open and free and accessible for everybody. The agreement is that the Department of Defense can take a look at that first. Um, so, and they will take out stuff you're not supposed to see. But it's another good example of a science project. Uh, if you're lucky and we get the tour at Slack early enough, I can still show you the camera. The camera is supposed to ship out, I believe, later this summer. So um, very been delayed for various reasons, um, COVID and, and construction in Chile and God knows what else. Anyway, yes, good sign. Louis can take another one from you. Uh, thank you. Um, I do have an interesting one here. Just let me pull it up. Uh, yes, we've heard lately that uh, the chip plant that TSM is building in the United States has been delayed because they can't find enough talent. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I think that's an example that I gave too. Uh, that's true. Um, the um, So Arizona State University is one of the largest engineering universities in the country. Produces about, I don't know, something like three to 5,000, you know, engineers, you know, in uh, um, annually. Um, to run a plant like TSMC, you know, which is the you know Taiwan, the big you know uh, chip factory in in Taiwan, you need about twenty thousand people. Um, you also need about I mean, it certainly took Taiwan, took the leaders of TSMC about twenty years to train their people up. Um, so this is one of the many reasons I'm suspicious about the Chips Act. I mean, you mentioned one reason industrial policy, but technically I'm very suspicious that mimicking a, a, a factory, assuming that you pump in $20 billion and you will have chips, you know, the next day coming out, high performance chips coming out the next day, when you compete with a highly trained, highly specific, you know, highly um, experienced workforce on the other end, it's gonna be really hard. 
So it's not only a numbers game, it's also, a, um, but you're correct. I mean, this has been lots in the press. And, you know, I don't know much about politics, maybe, but I know a lot about big projects. For me, this tip factory is another big project. And I always say, you know, when a fish starts to smell, it doesn't get better with time. Um, and and that clearly smells. Uh, there's not the talent in the country to do this. Talent is not trained. It will take a long time to commission this facility. That's going to be my bet. Um, and uh, and yes, it's a, but it's just, an, you know, TSMC and the chips is just one indicator. I mean, you just look at the Bay Area. We all read about you know, layoffs here in the tech sector. But, you know, so what happens to these people that are getting laid off? I mean, they have, a next, they have a job the next day. You know, you look at the national laboratory systems, universities, you know, NSF, wherever you go. Technologists and people, engineers, you know, scientists, they are, they are you know, looked for everywhere. There's simply not enough science talent around to do this. And then you combine this with, you know, I had this discussion with General Mattis, you know, who's at, mm -hmm. at Hoover. He's like, you know, did you know that, you know, about 15% of the positions in the in the US Army and the US, you know, defense are not filled? I had no idea. So, you know, this is a country that relies on on, on immigration in many ways. And I'm not talking about you know unlimited or you know, uncontrolled or anything, but if you look at the projections, um, and that's also studies we do at Hoover and at Spogli, you know, looking out fifty years, a hundred years, hundred years from now, China will be down to about eight hundred million people, and China has no business model for immigration that works. South Korea will only take until twenty fifty until they're down to about 35 million people. It's an overaged country with nobody wanting to move there, right? So while the business model in the US is moving here, you know, having a chance for your family, you know, for yourself to advance. I came here for the same reason. My boss told me when I was, you know, Maria knows that story. I think, how old was I, 29 or something? You know, I was a, a group leader at, at Daisy, and you know, I was always pretty aggressive. And then, you know, I went to my director and said, you know, when can I get when I can have you when can I have your job? Um and he said, he looked at me and he says, Well, you have to get gray hair before you before that happens. And I said, forget it. You know, I'm not them. so so I came to the United States. I ran a, the big science project in in uh, in Oak Ridge. I think I was 38, 39. You know, my colleague, who is now the director at Los Alamos, Tom Mason, was 37. And uh, and it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. I mean, it was to the contrary. Nobody cared. People care about performance in the States, right? They don't care about whether you, you know, where you came from or, you know, all that stuff, which is great. Uh, caring about performance, we've had an excellent uh, program tonight. Thanks to you. Uh, thanks to a system that attracted you to the U.S. and has kept you here. Thanks to the people online for the questions, the questions here. We will, as Lou said, have this posted in a few days on the Great Decisions um, segment of the First Church website. The topic for next week actually is an extension of several questions that have come up tonight. Uh, it's on the U.S.-China economic rivalry and how that affects uh, trade sanctions and trade regulations more generally. And I'm going to do that one uh, myself, whether that is an attraction or not. <laughs> uh, it's something, it's a subject that I've worked on for, for several decades. So, Norbert, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank uh, it was wedding. terrific. Maria, thank you for coming. And uh, thank, uh, thank you again too. And then think about the tour. So, and go thank to. You. We will, we'll definitely take you up on that. We just need right. to get information from Tom. All right. And then watch the movie Up Mime again. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Lou.
All right. Yeah. Um, again, um, the, say, the same Zoom is used for every session. So uh, make sure that you uh, have it available for next time as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now and stop the session. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your evening and a great week. Bye-bye now. Bye.